Good morning. Butch Eichels, the Country Church, Marion, Texas. A short drive to worship the Lord in a relaxed atmosphere. Well, good evening, everyone. Looks a little bit different than it did on Sunday morning. Good, they're running late, Dale says. Yeah, they're running late. So, 362 days. I didn't say that out loud. Say it, don't say the quiet part out loud, David. We better stand and praise the Lord tonight. Amen. <laughs> On the hill of Calvary, my Savior bled for me. My Jesus set me free. Aren't you glad? Look at the wounds that give me life. Grace flowing from his side. No greater sacrifice. What is done? Hey, in the back room, if y'all could put words up on the front screen, that would be awesome. Or y'all can all face back toward the back. All the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future. I think. For what he's done. We have professionals here tonight. It's the A team. We'll sing for the freedom he has won. Even death is dead and done. His life has overcome. Oh, speak. Say the name above all names. Over every broken place. He is risen from the grave. What he's done, what he's done. All the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God. And now, on a throne of majesty, the Father's will complete. He reigns in victory. Yes, he does. Sing hallelujah to the King. He is worthy to receive all the worship we can bring tonight. Oh, sing hallelujah to the King. He is worthy to receive all the worship we can bring. What he's done, what he's 
are forgiven my future is heaven I praise God for what he's done I praise God for what he's done tonight I praise God for what he's done blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but holy lean on Jesus name on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground Let's pray together. Lord, that's the truth. All other ground that we try to build our lives upon is sinking sand. And we pray, Lord, tonight, as these testimonies go forth, that it be an encouragement to us to continue to build our hope on the solid ground of Jesus Christ. May you be lifted up, not just what you have done, but what you are doing even in our midst tonight. And we gather to worship you and to be encouraged in the Holy Spirit as these who come share what you have done in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And you may be seated. And we're glad that you're here. If this is your first time to be with us at the Country Church, we welcome you. If you just lift your hand for just a moment, if this is your first time, our ushers have a packet of material they'd like to give to you. Anybody, it's your first time. Looks like it's looks like it's home folk. So we're glad glad to see you, Brother Butch and Joan are uh, taking a few days to to respite, to take a little vacation, and, and so they're going to be spending some time getting replenished. Um, hope you'll pray for them as they are out on the road, and um, wasn't Sunday a glorious day? Uh, thank the Lord for Resurrection Sunday, and we've got several things that are that are coming up, but one of the things is this luau that's coming in, in May, and Phil asked me if I would remind you that uh, you can sign up and get a ticket out in the out in the east foyer uh, tonight and doesn't cost anything but you do need a ticket in order for them to prepare make sure they know how many how many pineapples to purchase so <laughs> in just a moment um, Billy Smith and James Crown are going to come. I think James is going to come first, and then Billy will follow him to give their testimonies. And I uh, hope you'll give them your your attention to what the Lord's done in their in their heart. Um, during the 25th anniversary, we, the uh, choir sang a song that's been around for for a little while, and uh, we want to start putting it back in the rotation here at the uh, Country Church. And just ask the question, who can satisfy my soul but Jesus? Who can satisfy my soul like you? Who on earth could 
comfort me and love me like you do. Who could ever be more faithful, true? I will trust in you. I will trust in you, my God. Who can satisfy my soul like you? Who on earth could comfort me and love me like you do who could ever be more faithful true lord i will trust in you i will trust in you my Blessed Redeemer 
Is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me? He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of treasure I see. Oh, He hideth my soul in the cleft of the that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. And covers me there with his hand. my Lord, He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up, and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cloud. That shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. James, come and uh, share your testimony with us tonight, brother. <clears throat> this, this mic always shocks me when I speak into it. Um, the ones we have in the youth building. You have to get real close. Uh, the, this one is fantastic. Uh, so I don't know if uh, you all know this, but I am the youth leader here at the country church. Um, um, uh, I like my joke is I am the interim youth leader at the country church. Um, in 2011, I met with Brother Butch in January, and I became the youth leader, and he says, I'm going to announce it Sunday. And I said, Brother Butch, announce it as interim youth leader, and that way, if you don't like what I'm doing, and I don't like what I'm doing, we can both have an easy way out, and he's never uh, made another announcement, so... I'm still the interim youth leader since 2011. My first uh, year, this isn't my testimony, but my first year in 2010, um, the youth leader at the time asked me to, me and Liz, my wife, to go to camp with them. And I said yes, and just went as a helper, chaperone, uh, whatever he needed, and came home and said, I wonder if we'll ever get to go back. <laughs> uh, honestly, it was eye-opening. Um, I get emotional, but the youth have some, uh, a lot of real problems. And when you spend a lot of time with them, they tell them to you. And you hear them all. 
And uh, uh, I think that's why I relate to him. Let me go back. Uh, I wanted to say this to my sister, Wanda. She's probably watching on the live stream. She taught three-year-olds at her church for 20 years. And she said this to me the other day. She said, I realized that people have an attention span equal with their age. So I had three minutes with those three-year-olds. So I figure over in the youth building, I have about 15 minutes where I can talk to teenagers. So with you guys, <laughs> I'm just saying, um, maybe an hour. I don't know. I don't know how old you are. Okay. I grew up uh, 10 miles from a small town in the country in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Um, we were 10 miles out from Bowling Green, so uh, I had a four-room schoolhouse. Um, we had first and second grade in each class. Um, one teacher had two grades, and um, that first grade teacher was also my Sunday school teacher at the church next door to the school. Um, but at the end of my first grade year, there was a split at the church. I don't know if any of y'all have ever been to a church that has problems. <laughs> if you've been to church for years, you've been there. Um, and my parents quit going to church. Um, they didn't look for a new church. Um, they didn't. And basically, I grew up from first grade all the way through high school. Didn't go to church. I am not a church child. I didn't have that. Um, there was a man uh, who had a church down the road that had a bus, and he would come get some of us during the summer. And when they had youth events, we'd go to those youth events. But we were not regular church growers. So, uh, you know, I'd love to tell you I grew up in church and I've been saved since I was eight years old, but that's not my testimony. Um, when I was 19, living here in San Antonio, a friend invited me to go to church with him. Um, and I had already started working at the post office. I got a job there when I was 19, and I just retired. I'll tell you my age. <laughs> I worked at the post office for 39 years. So, um, But a friend, at the, uh, friend just invited me to go to church, and I went. And... You know, I've heard Brother Butch's testimony a million times, and he heard the invitation, and he walked the aisle, but that wasn't me. Um, but I went back next Sunday, and I went back the next Sunday, and I did that for about three months. Some people say I'm a little slow, okay? Um, but uh, after about three months... Um, I walked that aisle. It was Village Parkway Baptist Church over off of Calabria Road on the other side of town. Um, and I love telling this testimony because a friend invited me to church. So um, invite somebody to church is my, that's my, uh, so uh Started attending, uh, got baptized. It was, well, I'll give you my age again. Uh, people say you ought to remember. I do remember. It was 1983. So 40 years ago, I got saved at uh, Village Parkway Baptist Church. And I would love to tell you that um, I have faithfully followed the Lord ever since. But that's not my testimony again. 
um, was attending Bible study, was doing everything I thought I was supposed to be doing at that time, and was in a relationship, and it fell apart, and that was her church. I don't know if any of y'all have been there. Uh, it's why I tell teenagers today, I have teenagers, and they come, and they become a couple. And I'm embarrassed to say a, a month or two ago, I was talking to a couple of teenagers, and I said, um, which one of you is going to keep coming when you break up? Which is a terrible thing to say to two people who think they're in love. I, I apologize later, but that's been my experience as a youth leader. These kids, they come and they couple up, and then they get mad at each other, and then neither one of them come back to church because I can't go because he might be there. Anyway, that's why I said that. That's my testimony. And then I fell away from church for a few years. Um, just lived like people do. Um, worked, lived. Um, and then I met Liz years later um, hallelujah um, and honestly you know this is part of my testimony too Liz and I got married and Liz and I just lived for a few years and this is my testimony she says it was her idea to go to church but I think it was mine Okay, but she'll have to give that testimony. But I think we talked about it, and we agreed we needed to get in a church. Um, if we hadn't have done that, we wouldn't still be married. Um, that's my testimony, too. If you don't put God in your marriage, um, you can't survive in this world. There's no way. Um, so... We looked for a church, and uh, we lived about a mile from Crestview Baptist Church over off of Walsham Road, and started going there, and started going to Sunday school, and, you know, we decided we are bringing our daughter up in church, um, And if any of you know Kelly, that's the result of bringing your daughter up in church. She is um, faithful to the Lord, even in her 20s, um, and always has been. She said to me one day, because, you know, part of a testimony is life before Christ. And she said, Dad, I don't have a testimony and I said, what do you mean you don't have a testimony? And she said, you have always taught me who Jesus was and that I was a sinner and that I needed a Savior. And so I've never known a time where I didn't know that. Like most people have a before Christ. She said, so I don't have a testimony. And I said, I wish that was my testimony. So... Um, that's Kelly. Listen, and uh, when we started going to Crestview Baptist Church, we rededicated, and Brother Butch says this all the time, you can't rededicate what you haven't already dedicated, but I know that Jesus Christ lives in my heart. Um, I am saved, yes, and uh, we just went all in at Crestview. Um, we, a WANA program, eight years, uh, we kind of grew up in the church with Kelly. Um, the church needed nursery workers when Kelly was in nursery. We worked in the nursery. When Kelly started playing upward basketball, we taught and coached upward basketball. When Kelly went to Awana, we started teaching Awana. We started, um, 
doing all of that stuff. And, you know, bad news for Kelly, when Kelly went to youth group, <laughs> we went to youth group, um, and we've been out there ever since, even though she's way past youth group. Thank the Lord for her. She helps with music out there. Um, and th tonight, I actually taught a lesson over there. We reversed order. We normally start, uh, we'll do announcements, we'll do our music, then we'll do a lesson. And uh, I was going to have Bill teach for me tonight because I'm over here. But Kelly showed up and she says, Dad, why don't you just do your lesson now? You come over, we'll do music, and then you can come back at the end. And that's why they let me go first. Thank you for letting me go first. Um, I've had, we started going to Crestview Baptist Church, and people just stood out to me. There was a guy who was always there, no matter what the event was. His name was Guy Bannis. And I, I said to Liz one time, I want to be like him. And then we uh, friended, uh, we had a financial seminar there at the church. This one day financial guy came in and uh, I was standing by the Coke machine. They took a break and this guy walks up, this older man, he walks up and he, our Coke machine didn't take dollar bills. And he's like, hey, do you have a quarter I could borrow? And I said, you're borrowing a quarter at a financial seminar? Is what I, I have this sarcasm gift. I'm sorry. Kelly says it's a curse. Liz and Kelly tell me it's a curse. But um, every Sunday after that, this man walked up to me trying to give me a dollar bill and to pay me back. And we became really good friends. And they were, they were an older couple. And uh, if you all know my wife, she's a really good cook. And we would just take them food like three days a week. We would call them up and we would just take them food. And we would sit around and he would tell me what he had been reading in God's word. And we would just talk. And he used to get up on the stage and he would pray and he would just start crying. And uh, I asked him, Freeman, every time you get up and you're praying, you're always emotional, you're always crying. And he said, it's because I don't deserve what God's done for me. And uh, everyone who knows me knows I'm a little emotional sometimes. But I don't deserve what God's done for me. Um, I've had people in the church tell me, James, how do you stand being out there with those teenagers? I don't know. Only through God am I able to do that sometimes. Uh, it's, but I, we also love it. So um, God is the reason. I have a couple of verses that I like. Um, Romans 8 28 and we know all things God works for those who love him who have been called according to his purpose um, I left a word out of that didn't I when I wrote it okay um, that verse to me basically means that you know not all things are good but they all work for God's glory and it takes a some hard-headedness to get to realize that sometimes, but uh, David Kirkwood used to tell me uh, all the time, everything is for God's glory. Everything is for God's glory. You got to get that in your... And uh, another verse I like is 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us. Um, not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. Um, 
I like that word long suffering. Uh, Marcus asked me, I'm getting ready to go visit my sister. And she says, James, is your sister going to heaven? Um, I don't think my other sister will be watching this. But I said, one of them. Um, and so my prayer is I'm able to talk to the other one. It's funny, I can stand up and talk to teenagers every day and say, you need to be saved, you need to be saved, you need Jesus. It's really hard to talk to your sister about it. So uh, I'm praying that either I have the courage to it or God sends somebody to do it. Um, And I want to leave you with this. Most of y'all remember Stacy Ware. But he used to work out in the youth building before he went to Italy as a missionary. And he was telling, he told me this a long time ago. And he said, James, God never asked anybody to do anything that they were comfortable doing. And, you know, I talk to the teenagers twice a week, every week. And I'm still uncomfortable coming over here and talking to y'all. Um, but I, I'm just imagining y'all are all 14 right now. Um, so I want to leave you with this. Um, God has blessed me so much when I look at my life. I said, you know, I... Didn't follow him for a couple of years, and it wasn't that I wasn't following him. I just wasn't doing anything, you know, just living. Um, But I realized he took care of me during that time. Um, When I look back, he took care of me, and uh, he has been taking care of me ever since I accepted him into my life. And uh, I'm going to leave you with this. Are you comfortable Because if you're comfortable, you're probably not doing what God wants you to do. And that's my testimony. And I'm going back to the youth building. It's a testimony. May not be as pretty as his was. <laughs> but anyhow, Brother Butch gave me a guideline to go by here. And I'm going to try to go by it. But the very first thing on it was where were you before Christ? The only answer I had was lost. And that is what I was. So testimonies are stories. Everybody's got a story. You may you look at it as a as a something that you uh, have to work hard at. But if you just tell your story, yep. that's your testimony. This is my testimony. I was born in 1943 in Columbus, Mississippi. I loved my parents. They were good to me. They could not have asked for any better parents. They, my little sister and I did not hear the word love, Jesus, God, or any hugging as we grew up. But that was just the times. My mother and daddy could not, you could not ask for any better parents than they were. We never went to church. I didn't know, I didn't know God, knew anything about him. Well, in 1961, 
I graduated from high school and started to college. And the only time that I ever had any dealings with my Lord and Savior or even heard the word Jesus was when I, as a young man, when I spent night with friends that went to church and I would go to church with them on the weekends and then back to school or whatever. But uh, I graduated from school and I entered college two years, junior college. Did not graduate. Had two good years of hunting and fishing. <laughs> and uh, the president, who was uh, one of them doctor guys that uh, told me one time he didn't think I was fit for college, and I, I agree with you, brother. I, I think you're right. <laughs> I didn't want to come to start with. <laughs> But anyhow, uh, graduated from school and did all my little things that I'm doing. And I say, what were you doing after that? Well, I wrote down here that I was running wild, but I really wasn't. It, it ain't that bad. I wasn't running wild. I just was freelancing. You know? <laughs> but, but anyhow, uh, after that, uh, I applied for the, uh, after I was freelancing for a little while, I applied for the police academy and uh, joined the police force, Columbus, Mississippi. I gave the lady on the draft board a traffic ticket. <laughs> this was during the Vietnam War. And she said, what is your name? <laughs> and I, I had a tag on there. She ought to be able to read it. But anyhow, she said, uh, young man, you're going to pay for this. I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> so, sure enough, uh, not very long after that, I got drafted to the United States Army. <laughs> and uh, off of the police force, which they say you ain't supposed to be drafted off the police force. But anyhow, after I got drafted, I went to basic training and did my thing there. And I, I got, they sent me to, uh, I came out as a military police dog handler. Sent me up to Milwaukee, Wisconsin to guard some missile sites up there with my dog. And uh, when I got up there, I still, I don't, I didn't, wasn't around anybody that was talking about Jesus. And I, I mean, we didn't, we just did what we did, you know. In a, uh, you, when you're in the Army, uh, it's, it's a little bit different deal, you know. I mean, we, we wasn't out in the public round about and all, what have you. But anyhow, uh, after I, after I got drafted and, uh, did my little thing as a, as a dog handler. I still don't know nothing about Jesus. So then I'm getting, I got orders to report to San Francisco to be sent to Vietnam. And uh, I had a 30 day leave and sent me home for 30 days. I had a couple of friends that that uh, introduced me to my little Texas darling, Leslie, and uh, had a few dates with her, and uh, pretty good time, and got ready, to, had, to go to, had to go across the water. So after I, uh, my mother was an RN at that time, and uh, she was working at a hospital, and uh, she, a uh, lady at, at the hospital, gave her this little Bible right here. She said, she gave me this little Bible. She said, she knew I was going to Vietnam. She said, would you carry this with you when you go? I said, yes, ma'am, I sure will. I didn't tell her I'd read it, but I told her I was going to carry it. 
and I did. And I've had it with me ever since. But I don't, uh, I don't have it on me every day, but I've, it's, been, it's, been, it's traveled uh, many miles. And, uh, but I keep it at home, and it's going to always be there right by my bed and, uh, in remembrance of her. And she was my first step, I will say, toward Jesus. So after this, uh, I got on the plane. It was time for me to get on the plane. I got on the plane for San Francisco. And as that plane circled around the airport, little old town where I lived, I looked down and I said, this is it. This is the last time I'm going to see this place. I ain't coming back. I know I ain't. You know. But anyhow, we went on and I got on my plane and, and I made it. And I got over it. So when I got to Vietnam, they, uh, they, uh, Put me in uh, in in charge of a, a liaison representative. I, I was in charge of some transportation of products and everything over there. But anyhow, uh, I knew that I wasn't going to be coming back. But but during this time, I kept up. I was doing some really serious correspondence. Was Leslie, and uh, the letters were flying back and forth, and uh, she's got every one of them letters right now, and every, every so often she'll take them out and read them, not in front of me, <laughs> but, but uh, she takes them out and reads them. She got them all in order, a little old box and everything. If something happens to them, if, if I'm responsible for it, I'll die. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, so after I got through with, uh, got to Vietnam and everything, we, we had a, um, we was in a, not knowing Jesus still, but I had my Bible, but uh, I was beginning to get some insight for Jesus. So I put my two years in over there, and, I, and when I, my year, excuse me. When I came back, uh, I, I met Leslie again, and uh, I got back on. They let me get back on. They put me back on the police force when I got back, and uh, I met Leslie, and then I, I run her boyfriends off and everything, and then <laughs> and uh, after. We fooled around, and I just got married. It's time, you know. And uh, you always hear about people coming with baggage. Well, she came with baggage. Three, three little children. Just about that, about that high. And uh, well, I said, uh, you know, if I got her and I got them, I just. I may as well be the take the whole bunch, you know. So I adopted them, you uh, know. And uh, things was going good. Now, my oldest daughter is really where I got, where we kind of got introduced to Jesus. Uh, she she was she was going to church. We wasn't. I wasn't. But she was going to church and. And uh, talked to me, and anyhow, went, I, I came around and did what I was supposed to do, and, and I, I joined the church and uh, got baptized and went through the, all the motions and everything, but I hadn't felt anything to mount. You know, I was still kind of in limbo. I, I believed in, in Jesus and all, but so after that, uh, after that happened in uh, 1972, Les and I were blessed with a little baby boy. And uh, I don't know if I can put a picture up there. Mike was, was going to try to put it up there. Okay? But he was a 
big, big part of my life, and he's he's the reason, as they say, for the season. And so, after he was he was born with multiple multiple handicaps, couldn't couldn't I couldn't tell you all the things wrong with him. But anyhow, they said he wasn't going to live, and uh, he was in the hospital, and it was a stormy night, and. Uh, a doctor, another doctor, not her doctor, but another doctor, pulled me to the side and took me into a private room in the hospital, or, or empty room. He said, I want to talk to you, son. And I said, yes, sir. He said, if you want that child to live, you better get him out of here. You better get him to Jackson, Mississippi University Hospital as quick as you can. And I said, I took his advice. I, I wanted I wanted to throw a fit, but I, but it was a stormy night. All the electricity in the hospital was off. I was running on extra power and everything. Man, trees falling and everything. They said, "Would you please let us wait till in the morning, and we'll 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 get him out in the morning." And they did. And got him down there. All right, he's 150 miles away from Leslie and I, the family. And uh, the only way that uh, at that time I was a constable, I had a, uh, ran for constable and got elected, and I had my own car and everything. And uh, so we couldn't we couldn't go leave our kids and all. Didn't have didn't have a whole lot of people that, you know, that was take care of them and everything. So Les and I would go to Jackson on the weekends, and we stayed in a hospitality house, which was on the grounds of the university hospital. And it was built very similar, if you've ever been to one, of a Holiday Inn, just about like it. So we would go down on the, to the hospital on the weekends, and stay and then go back home and be ready to work Monday morning. So this particular time we were down there, it's about two o'clock in the morning, and uh, throwing caution to the wind, uh, about two o'clock in the morning, and uh, got a call from the doctor at the hospital. He said, uh, Mr. Smith, would you like Andy has, as he said, he put it like this. He said, Andy has taken a, a, a tailspin, and it's, we can't turn him around. We don't believe he'll live tomorrow morning. Would you like to, for us to call a priest? I said, no, sir, I don't think, I, I, don't, I don't see no reason to call a priest. I don't, yes. He said, well, somebody had tied with a ribbon a little St. Christopher medal on his on his ankle. And he's, and that's the reason he called to see if I wanted to preach. And I said, no, sir, I don't want to. And uh, he said, uh, I said, well, can we come up? We'd like to come over there. And uh, he said, no. He said, he said, there's too much going on. And we, we'd be working hard trying to save him. And, and, and it's just not a good time. And uh, I said, okay. And uh, he said, you can come over first thing in the morning. And uh, so I went back into the room. We were on the second story of this motel. I went back in the room. I laid down. Oh, man, I don't even know how to describe what, it, what was going on. I, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't, do, I couldn't sit still. I couldn't do anything. I told Leslie, I said, I got to get. It's in November, and it's cold outside. I told Leslie, I said, I've got to get outside and walk. I can't, I can't stay here. So I, so I went outside. She, she needed me to comfort her, and I run out on her. That's what happened. But anyhow, uh, I went outside, and I'm walking up and down this walkway, wall down there. And as I'm walking up and down, and uh, I am, this right here at this moment is when I really, really started 
to talking to Jesus. And I mean, I was pouring my heart and soul out to him. I was crying. I just, I was begging. I don't care anything, whatever. I don't care, God. Just, just do it. And as I turned around and started back to that wall, there was a most brilliant white image that appeared on that wall. And uh, I couldn't, it was an image. I couldn't see any facial features, anything. But if, if I'm lying, I'm dying. That image, and I mean, it, it, everything was just lit up. And he said, that image said, son, everything is going to be all right. Go and rest. And I'm telling you, folks, I'm, this is honest goodness true. Everything was lifted off of me. I felt just, I felt as calm as a cucumber. Walked in back in the room, laid down, and went to sleep. And as uh, soon as I, about 6 o'clock in the morning, the preacher calls, and uh, not the preacher, the doctor calls. He said, Mr. Smith, I don't know exactly what happened. But he said, he said, Andy turned around, and he said, it's like it ain't, wasn't nothing wrong with him. He said, he's just, he's. He's as good as he was when he And I said, uh, I said, well, can we come over and see him? And he said, yeah, come on over. And uh, he said, uh, I'm going to tell you something, Mr. Smith. He said, I don't know. I can't tell you what happened. He said, medically, I don't, we didn't do anything for him that I know of, that anything that we, that we hadn't already done. But he said, I'll tell you one thing. He said, my medical team, and, and, and it was like, I don't know, four or five nurses and all that stuff, and then the doctor. He said, we was in a circle of prayer, and we prayed for that baby. That was it. I know that was it. And then... Uh, after this, of course, now taking consideration, the doctor said he wouldn't live. He would not live very long. And, uh, but now he was in and out of the university hospital for a year, biggest part of a year of his life. We'd take him home, have to race him 150 miles back down there and get him back down there, and they'd put him on whatever thing they did and everything, so... Anyhow, uh, they had, uh, after he got, uh, got on his feet, got where he could go as a young man, as a young child, this, Andy was, was, uh, the, he was, he was the strength of our, of our family, and, uh, and I'm satisfied they say, they say God don't send you nothing except what you, what He wants you to have. And I know He sent that child to us for a special reason. I had people to ask me, "Aren't you, aren't you ashamed to take him out or whatever?" He couldn't, he couldn't read, he couldn't write, he couldn't hardly walk. But that dude was a shining light wherever he went. And uh, so I got. Uh, I said, no, I'm going to take him everywhere and do everything I can with him as long as, long as he's here. And uh, I don't know. Uh, I just know that uh, Andy died. Uh, well, in 1998, uh, I was not attending church. Uh, I had... Uh, experienced my little falling away from the church and uh, I was holding true to my guns and uh, but Leslie took deathly ill she was in the hospital doctors didn't know what was wrong with her she had five doctors working with her at one time and they nobody could really put a finger on anything what was going on with her but she anyhow 
she, I went, to, uh, my daughters all come in and everything. We was going, staying with her in the hospital and everything. So I go in and visit her one night. And she says, I'm, she said, I'm dying. I think I'm dying. Pretty sure I'm dying. I want to go home. I want to die at home. And I said, all right, baby, I'm getting you out of here. And uh, I, uh, I got her out and took her home. The doctor said, I, we don't know, we ain't doing nothing special for her. I don't guess it makes no difference. You know, she, she had one of them tubes, one of them IV things on her and everything. And, uh, and then I took her home. And uh, after I got her home, I went out to the barn and me and Jesus had a, I had a crying fit with Jesus again. And I told him, I said, Lord, you're not supposed to make deals with the Lord. He's not, he's not really in a dealing mood most of the time. But I said, Lord, if, if you'll let me keep my wife, I promise you, I'll get back in church and I'll stay there. And you do what you want to with me. Well, it was a pretty long recovery, but she came back. And uh, I got I got back to doing what I do. And uh, so after after that, two thousand and three, Andy died unexpectedly at work at Popeye's Chicken in Jackson, Mississippi. He was in a group home in Jackson, Mississippi. By his choice, he wanted to be with people of his kind. That's I asked him the first time he came home on leave from, uh, from the group home. I said, Andy, what do you think about that place? He said, Daddy, I want to tell you, you and Mama live with your people, I'm living with my people. And that's, that's, just the way, that's just the way he put it. So he died on April the 17th, 2003. They sent him back to get some paper towels or something in the, work, in the back. He never came back. He's, he's gone. He's, you know. But he had a, at that time he was, Doctors were monitoring a brain tumor on him, but, you know, it, he hadn't had any effects from it. And then, it, in fact, he was due right before he, uh, right after he died, he was due for uh, a recheck, you know. But uh, he died on April 17th, but the, the thing is, Leslie's birthday was on April the 16th. So he died the day after Leslie's birthday. And then on April, of, on April the 18th, my daughter, Shelly, my youngest daughter's birthday is on April the 18th. And on April the 18th, Shelly, my youngest daughter, and her sister, Sean, our oldest daughter, were on their way from Texas to come to Mississippi to bury her brother. And then Andy was buried on April the 19th. So we have April, is a, those four days of April is a, Call it snot swinging, whatever you want to call it, but it's it's happy, it's happy and sad, sad times at the same time for us, you know. But uh, all I know is Andy lived to be 30 and a half years old, and although he had so many health issues, he couldn't read, couldn't write, never attended public school. But I can tell you right now, he held our family and many other people firm to Jesus Christ our Lord. And that is a fact. And I'll tell you that had it not been for him, I don't think I'd be standing here. 
And even though I am standing here, I don't feel like I deserve to be standing here. God has been better to me, way more better than I ever deserved. There's not anything in this world that I want right now other than just, I just want to live. I'm in the bottom half of the ninth inning, people, 80 years old. So, you know, I, don't, I ain't got much longer to be here probably. And uh, he'll keep me as long as he wants me to, but this, just as, uh, but as long as I'm here, I want to serve my Jesus, my Lord, and my Savior. Thank you. Would you stand with me tonight? You've heard some stories coming out of hearts and coming out of lives. And, um, and they're just stories, except for the reality of Jesus being Lord and Savior. Um, everybody's got a story. But not everybody knows the Lord. And so if you're here tonight and um, there's never been a time in your life that you've opened your heart up and said, I, I was lost like James started this. I was lost. It's apart from God, away from God. And I need Jesus. If there's never been a time in your life where you've just said, I, I need the Lord. Um, tonight, you can be found by the Lord. And all you need to do is come down to the front here in just a moment. Rusty's going to be at the front. And just say, I, I need the Lord. And the scripture says in Romans 10, 13, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not a magic little phrase or you say it exactly with the right kind of intent. No, he, he says, come to me, call to me, and I, I will come to you. And you can be saved tonight and not just have a story, but have Jesus as your Savior. Perhaps you know the Lord, and uh, we're coming up on a celebration of baptism at the end of the month, and you know you need to follow the Lord in obedience of baptism. And you can come take Rusty by the hand and just say, I, I, I need to make that decision tonight, to follow the Lord in believer's baptism, or maybe... You've been, I mean, this is home folk tonight. You've been coming to the country church, but you you hadn't crossed the line and said, this is my church. This, this is my church. This is where I want to serve the Lord from, the country church. You can come and take Rusty by the hand and just say, I, I, want, to, I want the country church to be my church home. Or maybe there's a burden in your heart and you just need to pray. And you can do that right where you are, or this altar is open on either side, and you can spend time in business with the Lord. Maybe, maybe it's about your own story and your walk with the Lord. What, what is my story about Jesus in my life? So as we sing and as Rusty receives you, would you, would you make the decision that the Lord's put in your heart? Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God. as I am and waiting not to rid my 
soul of one dark blood to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot O Lamb of God I come I come just as I as I am, Thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because Thy promise I Thank you for sharing your story, brother. And be sure when you see James, I think they're about to take off on a little trip too, so you won't be able to see him till they get back. But but make sure you encourage him for sharing sharing what the Lord has done. Let's uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Would you pray with me? Lord, would you refine in our own hearts? the determination of what you have done in our lives, that we are not um, worthy to be standing before anyone and saying what the Lord has done except on the power of your authority and what you have done for us. It's not anything we've done, but what you've done on our behalf, that we receive your salvation and we walk in the power of that. Holy Spirit, we ask you to fill us and send us forth as laborers into your harvest, even this week, Lord. Send us out as branch offices. You are the vine and we are the branches. And give us opportunities to tell our story to the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, be safe going home. We'll see you on Sunday, on the Lord's Day. And the choir will meet in the music room. <laughs>